four American hostages in Iran, and this deal will only accelerate Iran's acquiring nuclear weapons. You better believe it. If I am elected president on the very first day in office, I will rip to shreds this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal. Why is that not, as Governor Kasich says, playing to the crowd and an example of you being inexperienced? Well, let's be clear when it comes to experience. What President Obama wants to do is he's run to the United Nations and he wants to use the United Nations to bind the United States and take away our sovereignty. Well, I spent five and a half years as the Solicitor General of Texas, the lead lawyer for the state in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and I went in front of the Supreme Court and took on the World Court in the United Nations in a case called Medellin versus Texas, and we won an historic victory saying the World Court in the U.N. has no power to bind the United States and no president of the United States, Republican or Democrat, has the authority to give away our sovereignty. And so if there's anyone up here who would be bound by this catastrophic deal with Iran, they're giving up the core responsibility of commander-in-chief and as president, I would never do that. Governor Kasich, did yeah. Senator well, Cruz just play to the crowd? Let me, let me just uh, say this. First of all, I think it's a bad agreement. I would never have done it. But, you know, a lot of our problems in the world today is that we don't have the relationship we're al with our allies. If we want to go everywhere alone, we will not have the strength as if we can rebuild our relationships with our allies. Now, this agreement, we don't know what's going to happen in 18 months. I served on the Defense Committee for 18 years. I've seen lots of issues in, in foreign affairs and, foreign, and, and in terms of global politics. You have to be, be steady. Now, here's if they cheat, we slap the sanctions back on. If they help Hamas and Hezbollah, we slap the sanctions back on. And if we find out that they may be developing a nuclear weapon, then the military option is on the table. We are stronger when we work with the Western civilization, our friends in Europe, and just doing it on our own. I don't think is the right policy. Thank you, Governor Kasich. I want to go to Senator Chicken. Paul. Chicken. I want to go to Senator Paul. Uh, Senator Paul, the White House is rolling out the red carpet next week for the president of China, President Xi. Governor Walker says that President Obama should cancel the state dinner because of China's currency manipulation and because of China's alleged cyber attacks against the United States. Is Governor Walker right? I think this goes back to essentially what we've been saying for the last two or three questions. Carly Fiorina also said, we're not going to talk with Putin. Well, think if Reagan had said that during the Cold War. We continued to talk with the Russians throughout the Cold War, which is much more significant than where we are now. Should we continue to talk with Iran? Yes. Should we cut up the agreement immediately? That's absurd. Wouldn't you want to know if they've complied? Now, I'm going to vote against the agreement because I don't think there's significant leverage, but it doesn't mean that I would immediately not look at the agreement and cut it up without looking to see whether Iran is complying. The same goes with China. I don't think we need to be rash. I don't think we need to be reckless. And I think we need to leave uh, lines of communication open. Often we talk about whether we should be engaged in the world or disengaged in the world. And I think this is an example of some who want to isolate us, actually, and not be engaged. We do need to be engaged with Russia. It doesn't mean we give them a free pass or China a free pass. But to be engaged means to continue to talk. We did throughout the Cold War, and it would be a big mistake not Go to do it. Governor hey, Walker, hey. Senator yeah. Paul seemed to suggest that canceling the state dinner would be rash and reckless. No, two, two parts to that. One on China, one back for a second on Iran. When it comes to China, why would we be giving an official state visit to a, a country that's been involved in a massive cyber attack against the United States? That's, that's not just a visit. That's a 21-gun salute in the South Lawn of the White House. It just doesn't make any sense. If we're ever going to send a message to them, wouldn't this be the time when they issued this sort of massive attack against us? And Jake, per the question, I was the, one of the first ones to call for terminating the bad deal with Iran on day one. The president came after me and said, I need to bone up. You know, the president who called ISIS the JV squad said, I need to bone up. The reality is it's a bad deal on day one, and it's a bad deal because this president has allowed Iran to go closer and closer. I'd love to play cards with this guy because Barack Obama folds on everything with Iran. We need a leader who's going to stand up and actually show Jake. Jake. Governor, Jake. Governor Jake. Bush, Jake. your father was the chief diplomatic envoy to China back when Nixon opened relations to China. Is Scott Walker's approach the right one, canceling the state dinner? No, I don't think so, but we need to be strong against China. We, we should use offensive tactics as it relates to cybersecurity to send a deterrent signal to China. There should be SIPR sanctions in what President Obama has, has proposed. There's many other tools that we have without canceling a, uh, a dinner. That's not going to change anything. But we, we can be much stronger as it relates to that. And as it relates to Iran, it's not a strategy to tear up an agreement. A strategy would be, how do we confront Iran? And the first thing that we need to do is to reestablish our commitment to Israel, which has been tattered by this administration. 
and make sure that they have the most sophisticated weapons to send a signal to Iran that we have Israel's back. If we do that, it's going to create a healthier deterrent effect than anything else I can think of. I want to turn to, I want to, turn to Governor Huckabee, who has been very patient. Somebody had to be 11th, and he is. But I do want to change the subject to the event that you had a meeting. I would certainly love to get in on this. Well, you I think can, it's you can, single, use, well, no, you can use your minute however you I'm, want, I've but I want to ask this question. Waiting, and I'm going to just Let say this say. about Iran. All right, sir, go ahead. Because I think it is incredibly important. This is really about the survival of Western civilization. This is not just a little conflict with a Middle Eastern country that we've just now given over $100 billion to. The equivalent in U.S. terms is $5 trillion. This threatens Israel immediately. This threatens the entire Middle East, but it threatens the United States of America. And we can't treat a nuclear Iranian government as if it is just some government that would like to have some power. This is a government that for 36 years has killed Americans. They kidnapped Americans. They've maimed Americans. They have sponsored terrorist groups, Hamas and Hezbollah, and they threaten the very essence of Western civilization. To give them this agreement that the president treats like the Magna Carta, but the Iranians treat it like it's toilet paper. And we must simply make it very clear that the next president, one of us on this stage, will absolutely not honor that agreement and will destroy it and will be tough with Iran because otherwise, we put every person in this world in a very dangerous place. Jake, Jake okay. I'd, I'd like to... We're going we're to turn now to Hugh Hewitt from Salem Radio Network. Thank you, Jake. Mr. Trump, yes. two years ago, President Obama drew a red line that the Syrian dictator Bashir Assad crossed. President Obama threatened to strike. He did not. His knees buckled. We now have four million refugees. Syria is a living hell. And he turned to the Congress for the authority to back him up. You have three senators to your right who said no. Do they bear responsibility for this refugee crisis? And what would you have done when Bashir Assad crossed that line? Number one, I wouldn't have drawn the line. But once he drew it, he had no choice but to go across. They do bear some responsibility. But I think he probably didn't do it not for that reason. Somehow, he just doesn't have courage. There's something missing from our president. Had he crossed the line and really gone in with force and done something uh, to Assad, if he, if he had gone in you with tremendous force, you wouldn't have millions of people displaced How all over the world. How much responsibility, Mr. Trump, did the senators hold? I think they had a responsibility, absolutely. I oh. think we have three of you, them here. Senator Rubio? I think they yeah. had a responsibility, yes. Senator Rubio, I have, there was time where we have zero responsibility, because let's remember what the president said. He said the attack that he was going to conduct was going to be a pinprick. Well, the United States military was not built to conduct pinprick attacks. If the United States military is going to be engaged by a commander-in-chief, it should only be engaged in an endeavor to win. And we are not going to authorize use of force if you're not putting men and women in a position where they can win. And quite frankly, people don't trust this president as commander-in-chief because of that. Senator Paul. I think this gets to the point of wisdom on when we should intervene and when we shouldn't. Had we bombed Assad at the time, like President Obama wanted, like Hillary Clinton wanted, and like many Republicans wanted, I think ISIS would be in Damascus today. I think ISIS would be in charge of Syria had we bombed Assad. Sometimes both sides of a civil war are evil, and sometimes intervention makes us less safe. This is the real debate we have to have in the Middle East. Every time we've toppled a secular dictator, we've gotten chaos, the rise of radical Islam, and we're more at risk. So I think we need to think before we act and know that most interventions, if not a lot of them in the Middle East, have actually backfired on us. Thank you, Senator Paul. I want to turn now to my colleague, uh, Dan Abash. Uh, uh, hold I want hold to turn on a second. Jake, uh, he asked me as well. I'd, I'd like to actually go ahead, sir. That to, would be to, fair. To, to You're right. To You're them. right. You're the third senator. I think I'm the first senator. <laughs> <laughs> the number one test for use of military force should be the vital national security interest of the United States. The reason why I oppose President Obama bombing Syria is because he couldn't answer the question, what do you do if chemical weapons end up in the hands of radical Islamic terrorists like al-Nusra, like al-Qaeda, like ISIS? Now, I also want to respond to several of the folks up here who said, we should trust this Iranian deal and see if the Iranians will comply. Anyone who's paying attention to what Khamenei says knows that they will not comply. There's a reason Khamenei refers to Israel as the little Satan, and America is the great Satan in the middle of negotiating this treaty. 
Khomeini led the assembled masses in chanting death to America. I'm reminded of a great editorial cartoon. It shows the Ayatollah Khamenei saying death to all Americans. And then it shows John Kerry coming back saying, can we meet you halfway? <laughs> we need a commander in chief who will stand up and protect this country. And I'll tell you, I can't wait to stand on that debate stage with Hillary Clinton and to make abundantly clear, if you vote for Hillary, you are voting for the Ayatollah Khamenei to possess a nuclear weapon. And if you elect me as president, under no circumstances will a theocratic Ayatollah who chants death to America ever be allowed to acquire Jay, a nuclear weapon. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jay, Senator. Jay, Senator heard. Jay, I want to... We're going to go to Dan and Bash. No, no, no. I want, gonna, I, want to say, I want to say something about what the Senator just said. And then it'll no be one my is, turn. No, let, me, let me suggest to you, we believe that we operate better in the world when our allies work with us. President Bush did it in the Gulf War. We work better when we are unified. Secondly, nobody's trust in Iran. They violate the deal. We put on the sanctions. And we have the high moral ground to talk to our allies in Europe, to get them to go with us. If they don't go with us, we slap the sanctions on anyway. If they fund these radical groups that threaten Israel and all the West, then we should rip up the deal and put the sanctions back on. And let me make it clear. Let me make it clear. If we think they're getting close to, a, to developing a nuclear weapon and we get that information, you better believe that I would do everything in my power as the commander in chief to stop them having a nuclear Jake, Jake. weapon. We can have it and we can have our allies and we can be strong as a country and we can project across this globe with unity, not just doing it alone. That is not what gets us where we want to get as a nation. Senator Cruz. Jake, there is no more important topic in 2016 than this topic right here. And I've listened to several folks saying, well, gosh, if they cheat, we'll act. We won't know. Under this agreement, there are several facilities in Iran they designate as military facilities that are off limit altogether. Beyond that, the other facilities, we give them 24 days notice before inspecting them. That is designed to allow them to hide the evidence. And most astonishingly, this agreement trusts the Iranians to inspect themselves. That makes no sense whatsoever. And let me note, President Obama is violating federal you, law by not handing over the side deals, and we ought to see the United States Congress you, stand up together and say, hand over this treaty and protect this country. Thank you, Senator. I want to Jake. turn back to Governor Huckabee. Jake. I want to turn back to Governor Huckabee. Governor Huckabee, last week you held a rally for a county clerk in Kentucky who was jailed for refusing to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, as I don't need to tell you. You've called what happened to Kim Davis, that clerk, an example of the criminalization of Christianity. There are several people on the stage who disagree with you. Governor Bush, for example, says that that clerk is sworn to uphold the law. Is Governor Bush on the wrong side of the criminalization of Christianity? No, I don't think he's on the wrong side of such an issue. Jeb is a friend. I'm not up here to fight with Jeb or to fight with anybody else. But I am here to fight for somebody who is a county clerk elected under the Kentucky Constitution that 75% of the people of that state had voted for that said that marriage was between a man and a woman. The Supreme Court, in a very, very divided decision, decided out of thin air that they were just going to redefine marriage. It's a decision that the other justices in dissent said they didn't have and there wasn't a constitutional shred of capacity for them to do it. I, I, I thought that everybody here passed ninth grade civics. The courts cannot legislate. It's what Roberts said. But heck, it's what we learned in civics. The courts can't make a law. They can interpret one. They can review one. They can't implement it. They can't force it. But here's what happened. Because the courts just decided that something was going to be, and people relinquished it, and the other two branches of government sat by silently, I thought we had three branches of government. They were all equal to each other. We had separation of powers, and we had checks and balances. If the court can just make a decision, and we just all surrender to it, we have what Jefferson said was judicial tyranny. The reason that this is a real issue that we need to think about. Thank you, Governor. No, no, let me finish this one thought, Jake. I haven't gotten that much time, so I'm going to take just what little I can here. We made accommodation to the Fort Hood shooter to let him grow a beard. We made accommodations to the detainees at Gitmo. I've been to Gitmo, and I've seen the accommodations that we made to the Muslim detainees who killed Americans. You're telling me that you cannot make an accommodation for an elected Democrat county clerk from Rowan County, Kentucky? What else is it other than the criminalization of her faith 
and the exaltation of the faith of everyone else 